Hi, this is Professor Cummings. Uh, this is just another video in Strength of Materials, just part of this original series. In this one, I want to go through a few concepts. One is the uh, modulus of rigidity, modulus of elasticity, as well as shear stress and strain. So from previous videos, you can see them in the description box. What we went over is the stress-strain curve. We went over actual stress and we went over strain. Now when we did this discussion we were talking about stress and strain in the uh, axial direction. So we were looking at stress and strain as you look at a column, look at a chain, look at a rope and you're actually pulling it or pushing it. Pulling it in tensile, pushing in compression. And we defined stress and strain and what we found was that stress identified by sigma is just the load over a cross-sectional area or P over A sometimes it's called F over A but load over area and strain is the change in length over the original length and delta L over L original so that's stress and that's strain and if we were to map out stress and strain and put it on a graph what we would find is we'd end up with the stress strain diagram and we discussed, you know, that the stress strain graph had four uh, four distinct uh, areas. One was the uh, proportional limit or the elastic limit, sometimes called the hook limit. The second area was just known as the yielding stage. This is the area where it goes to the point where it's actually deforming, permanently deformed, as opposed to the elastic limit where it actually can recoil back. Then there's the third stage, which is just known as strain hardening. This is where the crystals in the material are actually starting to get distorted, causing it to be stronger and tougher until it reaches this ultimate strength of the material. And then after this point where the strength is actually getting weaker in the material, we call this necking, and then we end up at fracture. So this is the four stages. What I want to talk about in this video is going to be pretty much around the elastic limit. When we look at the elastic limit, this is the area where we do most of our design work. So when we design, we typically want to stay in this area where the material will actually get distorted and then come back to its original shape. Now in this, the reason we like this particular area is because it's very predictable and you can actually graph it out. Now, if you graph, uh, graph it out and come up with, you know, a coefficient or, uh, of something called the Young's modulus, also known as the modulus of elasticity, what that tells us is it's a ratio between the stress and the strain that make, is very predictable and lets us know how much this material, how elastic this material will be in a design. And each material will have a distinct uh, uh, modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus and since Young's modulus is just the rise of the run we can define it mathematically as E which is Young's modulus is equal to the stress divided by the strain or the ratio of the stress to the strain and like I said it is a very unique signature for different materials you can actually look at various materials and see that they you know as you look at them in their elastic limit or their proportional limit or their hooks limit, what you want to call it, that you can actually see how the elasticity or that ratio, that slope, is very distinct. If you look at a very rigid material such as glass versus a material such as rubber, you can actually see that there's a very distinct profile to how these materials are going to respond when you put them under stress and how much strain, respective strain, you can expect. And like I said, the, you know, that ratio is consistent throughout that uh, proportional limit or the elastic limit. And if you look at glass, depending on the composition of the glass and the rubber, you can actually see that these are mapped out and can be very, very predictable. Again, this is dependent on the type of glass and the type of rubber. So that explains things when they're in an axial position, when you're looking at something being pushed or pulled axially you know, through its axis. Now what happens when you have another form of loading? We touched on this in the first video. When things are in shear. Now when you have something in shear, in this, in this case I've got a little schematic of a bolt and you've got uh, different uh, force 
here are a load. This bolt is actually under shear stress. There's a shear force is being applied to it, and there's a shear stress and a shear strain that corresponds with that. Now, stress is easy to define. It's just the force over a, a axial or a, over an area, a cross-sectional area. So it's still the same. It's just the force over this particular cross-sectional area here. That's our area of concern. So if we want to know what the shear stress is in this one, we just you know take that force and divide it by whatever the cross-sectional area of the bolt is. But what happens when you want to understand the strain that's taking place? Well, you know, the strain in terms of axially is the change in length versus the original length. But in this case, you don't have a change in the length. You know, your change is going in a shear direction. So how will we look at this? So what we can do is we can look at this say a blow up of the bolt and we just take the bolt as being this rectangle represented by this rectangle and we're just concerned with this section here the uh, the area that we're concerned with now if we take consider this area we can look at the fact that it's a, a rectangle and we can just say these the rectangle has four square corners or 90 degrees and we can convert that to radians which is just 2 pi or excuse me, pi over 2. Now if we put this under load, take this from this original state and apply a load to it, the load that we see here in this in this diagram, put this under load, we will see some level of distortion to it. So there it is, we're applying a strain, or there is a strain that shows up in this material, in that bolt. So we've got this original angle of 90 degrees, or pi over 2, we apply a force to it and we over a cross-sectional area so this is a force and we see this sort of distortion in the shape of, of the uh, of the bolt you know so the bolt is actually twisting you know from top to bottom so this is the top of the bolt and this is the bottom of the bolt all right so if we want to understand what shear is going on we have this new angle that's being brought about We'll call that angle theta. All right, so we've got a original angle of 90 degrees, a new angle theta of what where the bolt is going. So we can look and see, well, what is left over? What we have left is this area here, this, this angle that is being uh, distorted or pulled away from. Now, now that is just the difference between the 90 degrees, or pi over 2, minus theta. And we'll call that angle gamma. All right, so gamma is just the difference between pi over 2 and theta. And that is what defines our shear strain. So we're seeing the original minus the new angle and what's left is this gamma and that's just what's how we're defining shear strain in this case and this is all in radians so we can still treat this as a unitless a unitless number and if you look at a stress strain diagram you know we do have a stress and we do have a strain and we can see it on this graph we can chart these on a graph the same way we could with our axial stress and strain we get something that looks very similar to the axial uh, stress strain curve. Only this one is actually in shear. So it's a shear stress strain relationship. And this is just a generic uh, stress strain uh, diagram, a shear stress strain diagram. You know, so just like with glass, just like the different materials, they'll all have a little unique profile to it. But one thing I want you to notice, or a few things I want you to notice, we still have a fracture point. We still have an ultimate stress. And we also have an elastic limit. So there's still a lot of similarities between this and the stress strain diagram when things were in axial load. And this is still the area where we design. So we still design in this, this area where things can have a load, where you can put a load to this bolt or whatever material, and you can still have a recovery. So that's the stress strain diagram under shear. That's how you define the shear stress. And that's also how you define this new number or this new term called 
the shear modulus or the modulus of rigidity, which is nothing more than the slope, the rise of the or the rise over the run while in that elastic state. You know, so instead of E, this one in shear is known as G. So just giving a little bit of a summary on them. So they just, you've got your Young's modulus versus your shear modulus. I oftentimes describe these as being analogous. Young's modulus is described with an E, term, uh, defined with an E. Shear modulus are modulus of rigidity with a G. They both are stress over strain stress over strain only in uh, Young's modulus or axial it's sigma over epsilon and shear modulus it's tau over gamma they're both within the proportional limit or Hooke's law you know the elastic limit and they this one utilizes Young's modulus utilizes normal loads you know ax, uh, tension versus compression whereas the modulus of rigidity uh, uses shear or torsional loads this is Professor Cummings. I uh, just wanted to give you this one more series, one more video in the series of strength of materials.